Today, uh, I want to talk uh, about how we brought the sort of, you know, what everyone's hearing about today with serverless, how we brought that model to, uh, to cloud IDEs. And essentially, we didn't do it on purpose. We almost did it accidentally. So what Replit is, before I get into the serverless stuff, is it, Replit is, our, our mission is to bring programming to more people. We want to be able to um, support any device, any computer out there. Anyone who has a computer should be able to code. Should, coding should be as easy as opening a new tab. That's sort of like what, what we do. And from there, we kind of get progressively more advanced. And I'll show you some of the stuff that you can do with the, with the platform. So it is essentially an online IDE for more than 50 programming languages, zero setup. You can just start immediately. And it's becoming also a platform for hosting code and hosting apps. And on top of that, we have a very friendly open community um, uh, for people who are getting started with programming and even advanced programmers as well. So um, I'll give a quick demo. So you know, the, the get, getting started experience is that you basically pick a programming language. Uh, I'm, just going to pick Node.js here. You name it. So let's say uh, DevZone. Um, create a REPL. And you're immediately booted up with an interactive programming environment. So you see a big green run button. And that kind of invites you to just start coding and start doing something. On the right, we have the REPL. And you can sort of, it's like an interactive REPL. You can define variables. You can you know console log. Uh, variables and, and, and do d anything you could do with a REPL. But it gets a little bit more interesting when, say, you, know, you want to um, require, let's say you copied some code from the internet and had uh, the library Lodash. Uh, Replit will automatically detect that and will start installing the package. So that's something we do to just make um, so programming a lot easier, and so I can I can use I can use any and you immediately get really good autocomplete as well, so you don't have to set up any you know LSP or anything like that. We just do it for you, and I could run that. Where it gets really interesting is that let's say I want to get uh, a server running, so I can do something like um, import Express.js, so I can go to our package manager and import express. Let me just zoom that in. The moment I hit add, it will create a package JSON for me and will start installing express. By the time I go back to the, to the editor, uh, express is already available for me. I can require that. I can start uh, express app. I have an app. And say, um, on root, we're going to just say, Hello world. And uh, someone, someone shout a port for me. Any port. 8080, I heard. So any port would work. The IDE will detect that you're trying to do web programming and will open up a web view. And now we have a website hosted at devzone.amsi.repl. And it just. It's cut off on your side here, but it just says, hello world. And that's like hosted forever, and you can come back to it any time. Um, I could also open a shell. And I could inspect my files uh, from the shell. And now, you might be starting to think that this is, this is running on a VM, that there's like a VM powering this in the back end, and you can do whatever you want on it. However, it's not. What we do, all of this is running in a container. And say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just use uh, Chrome DevTools to put it offline. So I'm going to put it offline. It's, it, it stopped loading. Now put it online again. Everything went back to the same state. And what has happened there is uh, we either spun down the container, or uh, if we spun down the container, then we're going to start a new container. We're going to bring all the existing state 
and there's going to be sort of a negotiation protocol between the IDE and the container. Like, here's my state. I have a shell open. I have a window that I'm uh, programming a website open. And we reconstruct the state in a, in, a, in a matter of milliseconds. We copy the files into the container, and we spin everything back up. And this use case is not only viable for like web programming, you could also do native application programming. So here's like the famous Pygame, um, uh, the famous sort of Pygame uh, uh, game uh, framework. And I'm, g I'm just going to run one of their examples. And we're going to stream down VNC and start playing games in the, in the browser. And so, and let me go back to the, to the presentation now. So let me walk you through a little bit of history of how we, how we built this. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail on the back end and how we built our like, uh, fake VM via serverless model. So what, what we want is we want a sandbox to execute code in. Uh, we we want to execute unsafe code that, uh, that was given by our users. And it needs to have access to system resources. Anything that you can do beyond the simple case of practicing a program, you have to actually use system resources, network, file system, et cetera. It should work everywhere. It should be cross-browser. And it should load fast and should be extremely cheap. Right now, today, Replit has more than a million monthly active programmers writing code on our platform. If we were to give a VM to everyone, like say you know Google Shell or some of these VMs uh, with a, with an online editor, you know it's going to be very very costly, and most of our users don't have the money to actually pay for that. So, our first pass, we're like, okay, um, since we want this cheap, um, what we're going to do is we're going to actually like compile all the languages to JavaScript. We're going to use uh, Wasm JS, and we're going to create, uh, we're going to emulate this POSIX layer on the client to make it work on your browser. We ran into a lot of problems. It had a huge bundle size. We had a, like a 15 megabyte JavaScript bundle for like Python and all the kind of Unix interfaces. And you know, if you're someone with a Chromebook somewhere with a really bad connection and you're downloading this much JavaScript, you're going to run out of memory just trying to parse the JavaScript. And it also didn't have access to real system resources no matter how much we try to fake it. So now we moved it to the back end. But that was, that, was two, that was almost three years ago. And serverless wasn't really a thing. Like It started becoming a thing, but it wasn't even uh, on our minds. So we had to make something that was cheap enough uh, that we could run. So it should feel like a VM, but the VM is actually very costly. right? So what we did, we're like, all right, we're going we're gonna to do it, run, we're going to make it run on on-demand containers. Containers should be ephemeral. Anytime we, 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 we take out the sort of computing, um, anytime you're idle in the IDE, we should be able to, to, take your, to take your container from you and only bring it back when you're actually executing code or you're doing something in the IDE. It should run on preemptible uh, Google compute engine or AWS spot, uh, spot instances. Basically, you want to run it as cheaply as possible. Preemptible compute is 80% cheaper. So how do we do that? And it's like, again, it's this ephemeral model. It should have a reproducible state. Like, so let's say you know, we're on GCP preemptible. They take uh, one of our instances, and you're coding on that in a container inside that instances. We should, we should be able to reconstruct the state and you should not basically feel that, that there was a change. Um, and it's, it should scale up on down uh, according to demand. So he, here's the architecture that we came up with. So that, you know, we started building this before Kubernetes was the phenomena that it is today. Maybe if we built it today, we'd start with Kubernetes. But when we started, we are like, OK, we're going to have these uh, this, uh, v virtual machine instances. Inside them, we're going to have Docker. We wrote our own container manager orchestration system. We're going to have the files live on GCS. We're going to have some kind of state in Redis and etcd. And uh, we're going to have a Docker image registry. And then we're going to have a proxy that actually 
uh, whenever a request comes in, finds the container and connects you to the right container. So when we start a REPL, which is what we call a project, a REPL is basically a union of a Docker image, a, um, a, a GCS state in terms of files, um, and some kind of internal state about who the user is and uh, authorizations and what collaborators they have and, and, and different things like that. Um, so that's kind of the high level over, overview of our, of our backend. To dig deep a little bit into the, into the uh, components, uh, Conman is our container manager. You can think of it as something like, like um, Kubernetes or Docker Swarm. It like figures out uh, what needs to run, where it needs to run, and creates the containers for, for those things to run. PID1 is a program that we inject into the container, and PID1 is basically a, the init program that we use. PID1 knows how to talk our, pro, our, our protocol, and it's responsible for reproducing the state when you get a new container. So when you get a new container, we inject this program at runtime that we call PID1. It gets run, and now it's negoti negotiating the state with the client in order to reproduce it to the best of its ability. Um, and then container registry, we, we like to we support a lot of languages, a lot of environments. So for every environment, we create a new container. And we, we're constantly updating these containers, fixing bugs, releasing security issues. So we use uh, Google Container Registry to be able to, um, to do that. And storage, it was like a no-brainer to use GCS for, for storage. Uh, for the proxy, you saw me how when I started a web server, it just understood that I want to serve some external traffic. And what we do is we add some state to our Redis, and then our proxy knows where to send the traffic. We, we, we get a... We get a we get a cert from Let's Encrypt, and we give you HTTPS on the fly. And finally, the state where you know, I mentioned it, it lives on, on Redis and, and, um, and the other places. 